So this actually ties in well to the reason that uh, Chris is in the studio right now, which is to talk about a long-standing uh, civic irritant uh, and a cause that he has championed over the years, uh, which has to do with the phenomenon known as the Philly Shrug. What's the Philly Shrug, Chris? The Philly Shrug is uh, when you see something happening um, in your city where elected officials are failing to do what they should do, or even worse than that, stealing the money that should be devoted to a cause and spending it on their own their own reasons and their own corruption, or simply, you know, the garbage doesn't get picked up, the pothole sits there for, you know, ever. Things just don't work the way they should, particularly for people who are paying 4% of their income to the city to get things to work. There's a kind of... Um, resigned anger. It's not an anger that drives towards change. It's not a throw the bums out anger. It's kind of a like, what are you going to do? You just sort of shrug and go. It, it always reminds me, different city, but it always reminds me of the end of the movie Chinatown. Chinatown. Where the guy says to Jack Nicholson, it's Chinatown, Jake. You know, there's <laughs> nothing you can do. Uh, actually, there is plenty we can do. And the first step is in uh, giving up the Philly shrug and changing it into the you know the the Philly intent to change. I know yeah. that's not very dramatic, but uh, essentially, there's a lot of things that have happened to make this city better in the last fifteen or twenty years. That the smart guys, the smart money, always says there's no point. That you know it's Philly. It's just the way the things are. Uh, we know, very few people know this, and traveling around the state, I always bring this up, and no one outside of yeah. Philadelphia knows this, that this city I has, know where you're going now. has the <laughs> strictest campaign finance laws and the strictest ethics laws for its city council and mayor of any city in the United States of America. And it also has one of the most active and strict boards of ethics that enforces those rules. Nobody knows that. But actually, there's been plenty of corruption still in Philadelphia. It is still Chinatown, Jake. But all of it has happened outside of the territory covered by those rules, which is city council yeah. and the executive branch. And I should say, because you were a part of that, thank you to the Inquirer and the Inquirer Editorial Board, and thank you to the Committee of 70 for right. helping to make that happen. So it seems to me that is that is part of the, uh, the antidote or the inoculation or pick your metaphor for – uh, the Philly Shrug is to recognize that, like, we actually can do stuff, and that we have done stuff, and we'll continue to do stuff. So, yeah. So, you know, the Philly Shrug certainly greeted all, you know, the fervent editorials and columns we were writing in the Choir and all the work that, you know, under Zach Stahlberg and others, the Committee of Seventy did around this issue. Um, but we kept reminding people, you know, to make change. In Philadelphia, all you need to do is get to nine. Nine votes mm -hmm. out of 17 on city council. Just as in Harrisburg, the number is 102 yep. and 26. Those are the numbers you need to, to make change in the Senate and uh, the House. And it can be done. It has been done in significant ways. And the biggest impediment to it is that shrug, that belief that there's no point. Why try? Yeah. Keep trying, keep plugging, and sometimes great things happen. I always go to the if you see something, you got to say something kind mm -hmm. of a thing. And it's not just contingent upon, you know, the great and powerful folks at the Committee of 70, but it's like everybody's job to, if you see something, say something. Which leads me to, you know, topic of today is once again sort of wither millennials' uh, political involvement, engagement. Uh, you and I both have been here long enough to see successive waves of folks uh, blunt their swords in some ways on uh, changing the, the political culture. What What's your take on the young involved Philadelphia folks, the kind of folks that we had today, the Buckholtz Fellows, the sort of activist millennial uh, types? Uh, they're, they're the grounds for hope um, because it starts out with they love this city. They chose this city. They weren't forced to live here. They came here because they wanted to. And where they are in their neighborhoods, they're building neighborhoods that work, and they're building cultural networks that work, and they're worried about the environment. And, you know, every once in a while, maybe some people our age get annoyed by it, but they're putting bike lanes everywhere because they have a vision for how this city is going to work. And I love it. And the difference with this generation, I mean, this has actually been going on, you know, Young and Ball's been around for, I don't know, 15, 17 years. 17 years. Yep. That first generation, there were people who had tremendous uh, energy. They had social and environmental conscience. 
but they had pretty much given up on politics as you know a lever for meaningful change. And a lot of what they tended to do was at ground level. They were founding organizations and nonprofits, and they were doing you know often great work. But rarely did their efforts cohere in anything that drove systemic change at the level we needed to fix the schools or take care of the really big issues. This group is different in that they're looking at the Democratic Party. They know this is a one-party town. And they see that there's billions of dollars that's controlled by Democrats who get elected. And they say, well, what if people who had our values and our social and environmental uh, justice goals were actually controlling the levers of power in the yeah. city, and they're trying to build patiently towards that. That is really a big change. Yeah, it is. Well, and we were talking about your former colleague, Elizabeth Fiedler, who's running mm-hmm. for state rep uh, in November. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, as, as an example, it's like, I can do this. I can run. Uh, also reference uh, the podcast episode of A Few Back, where we talked to Ali uh, Perlman from Philly 3.0 about the surge of interest in people serving in uh low-level committee spots and opening up wards and so forth. So it feels like productive political ferment, huh? Yeah, I have a, a, a somewhat apologetic anecdote to tell about Liz. Um, Liz and I you know, worked together for years. I was her boss. We're very close. When she decided to run, she called me up and said, I want to talk to you about something. I thought she was like leaving WHO. I want some work. So I showed up. We had coffee somewhere. She was there with her little baby son, who at that point, her second child, was two or three months old. She says, I'm going to run for state representative, and I spent the next hour trying to talk her out of it. <laughs> Shows how much I know, right? But by the end of that hour, I knew that she had thought this through and looked at it from every angle, and she really knew what she was doing. And yeah. by God, she went out and Yeah, and by it. all accounts, just poured herself uh, into the race and kind of good old-fashioned, you know, uh, knock-and-drag uh, operation and uh, sounds likely to be uh, – representing her uh, community in Harrisburg. Yeah, talking so. about grounds for hope. That's yeah. another thing that gets me up in the morning thinking we're yeah. headed in the right direction. Yeah. All right. Chris Atulo, thanks, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you.